So, what's up guys, it's another episode of Angular Academy Show and today our guest is Mike Ryan, who is the core member of NGRX team. Yes. So, uh, the goal of this talk, the goal of this uh, webcast is to give you guys a little bit of insight of what NGRX is. And I think the perfect person is the core member team. So, Mike, can you just give us a little bit of introduction of what you do and how did you start working as a core member team of NGRX? Sure. I'm a software engineer at a company called Synapse. And a number of years ago, I used to work for the U.S. Army. Mm -hmm. And at the U.S. Army, I helped build these educational video games for the browser. Mm -hmm. And what I found when we were building these video games is that the state of our video games could change from a variety of sources. Users could interact with the games, we'd make HTTP requests to save their scores, and we'd get WebSocket messages for multiplayer games. Mm -hmm. It was very difficult to reason about how these changes propagated in our application. So you found some general problem. Yeah, we found a problem. It's hard to track how state changes in our app. And when I say state, I mean any data that's going to change as your application runs. Okay, and um, when did you start working on NGRX? So we were just starting to look at moving to Angular 2. Angular 2 was having some of its very early uh, milestone releases. Mm -hmm. And we said, okay, we want to do something different. We don't want to do the service-oriented approach because it's been difficult for us so far. So let's go look at some other languages and tools and see how they solve this problem. And one of the languages we looked at was a language called Elm. Mm -hmm. And Elm has this notion of a unified state management mm -hmm. uh, framework. And basically the way it works in Elm is you have these changes that your application can emit. And then you have these functions that take state and that change mm -hmm. and produce a new state. And it's all unified in the application. And every component uses the same means to ch make changes to state. And every component uses the same means to read state from it. Because you said a very important thing that you wanted to do something different and you mentioned service-based approach. Yes. So can you give us a little bit of insight? What is this service-based approach? So service-based approach is what I'd say or best describe as the thing you learn from Tour of Heroes. That is, you write these class-based services mm -hmm. using the injectable decorator for each entity in your application. For instance, you might have a user's service mm -hmm. and a book's service, and you write different services for each of these things. Mm -hmm. And then your components inject these services to make requests, to read what the current set of books are or users, and that's a very common approach to building an Angular application. Yes, and uh, sometimes we would go with this service-based approach and sometimes you would, you would rather go with something different as it was in your case. Right. So, um, can you tell us, like, if I would ask a question, what is NGRX? Like, by definition, two sentences, how would you, uh, somebody comes to you, hey, I have never heard about it. And in two sentences or three sentences, like a concise definition, how would you describe it? Sure. NGRX is a global store for your application state built using pure functions and RxJS. Cool. So if we think about RxJS, I think about observables and yes. streams. So how does it fit into the big picture? Right. So going back to that Elm-based architecture I was talking about earlier, it had this thing of changes. And we said, well, what if we took those changes that an Angular component produces and we model those as an observable? Mm -hmm. And so what we do is we take all of these different event sources in an Angular app, mm -hmm. and we model them as observables and merge them all together to what we call a unified stream of changes. And anybody who is interested can subscribe to it. Exactly. So the thing is that we have, like, a, as you said, the source of truth, the single source of truth, right. that is going to be propagated across the whole application, right? Right. So that source of truth, the store, it subscribes to that stream of changes. Mm -hmm. And then it calls pure functions, which we call reducers, that take the previous state and that new change and produce a new state. So what are the benefits of using such approach? So the benefits are, first, the biggest one in my opinion is testability. Mm -hmm. NGRX emphasizes what I was called was a pure function. And pure functions have a really limited scope in terms of what they can do. Mm -hmm. For any given input, a pure function returns the same result. 
So I it's mean, easy to test. It's very easy to test because you don't have to mock out very much when you're actually testing a pure function. Instead, you can call the function with some set of legal parameters, and then you can assert that the result is correct. So first of all, we have testability. Yes. Any other benefits? The second benefit is performance. NGRX is built also on a concept called immutability, mm -hmm. which means that we don't mutate any of the state in the application. Instead, these reducer functions take the previous state mm -hmm. and an action, and they return a brand new state. It's a whole new object. So it sounds like there is something like on-push strategy with Angular. Exactly. Because it's returning new objects instead of mutating previous ones, you can use the on-push change detection strategy in your components. Exactly. This makes Angular change detection much faster when you're using NGRX. Because when the model changes, I mean, we don't have to deep compare everything in the model to know if we have to re to let Angular know if we, it has to re-render the view, right? Exactly. Instead, it can just use a simple reference equality check. Exactly. The triple equal sign in JavaScript to say, are these two things the Is same? Is it the same object, right? Exactly. Because we know if it was changed, it must have been the new object reference. Yep. So a whole new reference. Cool. So the other thing is the performance. Yes. Um, so a lot of people say that, you know, NGRX is hot and cool. Yes. And uh, I want you to ask, I mean, when exactly is the case to use it? And then we will jump into when not to use it. Right. So you're going to want to use NGRX or something like NGRX when you start to have what I call a shared state problem. Shared state problem. Which is you have many components that want to read from the same state mm -hmm. as each other. So let's say we were building an application that had a list of products. Mm -hmm. And you had one online page. Shop, yeah, like an online shop. And on one page you showed all the products. Mm -hmm. And so you made one request to go get each of the products and all their information. And then you have another page that wants to show a single product. We've well, already made that request on the previous page, and maybe you don't want to duplicate that request. So you could say that both of these pages want to share the same state as each other. A single entity of product. Exactly. And so that's what NGRX emphasizes, is it's a shared state container, and components can both read from that same unified source of truth. So we are getting rid of the problem that we can have inconsistency, like two instances of the same entity, but with different values in different places in the app. Exactly. Um, that's kind of a thing. So, uh, And then what we need to do, because we know it's immutable, but right. what we need to do when we really want to make a change. Mm -hmm. There must be a means of changing this because when a user edits this product, we need to somehow create a new instance, right? So how do we do this? Yes. So let's say you had a form to make a change to that product. When, that, when the user hits save on that form, that component does something way different in an NGRX application. Mm -hmm. What it does is it dispatches what we call an action. Mm -hmm. And what it has is that action will say, the user has changed this product, and here's the set of changes. And that's where the component's responsibility is. That's it. It just, that's it. it just uh, and then what happens next? And then from there, these functions called reducers can listen for that action. It can say, oh, I see someone has changed a product, and I manage the state of all the products in the application. So let me go find that product in state and apply that change to it, returning a new state. Okay, and then the new instance would be dispatched for all the subscribers, right? Exactly. They all inject the store, which is an observable of state. Mm -hmm. And do we need to create some initial state uh, when we create an application? Because if all the state lives in one place, is there something uh, that we need to care about in this case? Yeah, so every reducer function manages its own slice of state. Mm -hmm. And in that reducer function, not only does it have all of the cases for how it changes state, but it can also specify an initial state. And so that initial state for our products might just be an empty list until we've actually loaded some products from the back end. For more complex states, it can specify some initial default values that change as the application runs. Okay, cool. So. Uh, one of the things that come to my mind when we think about uh, like a single source of proof as a state, uh, can we store the state somehow somewhere in a local storage or some database and like get it back and retrieve the application state? Yes, that's another big benefit of NGRX. 
it recommends that you use only plain JavaScript objects. That is something that you can safely pass to JSON.stringify and then use JSON.parse to get it back to the same thing. And because it's built on these plain JavaScript objects, that means it's easy to take that state and put it in local storage, or maybe index.db, or maybe rehydrate from Angular Universal. That's the thing. We can then rehydrate, rehydrate the application state. Exactly. When we would, would like to get it from some persistence mm -hmm. and load to the application. Right. That's kind of cool benefits, huh? Yes. So, uh, I must ask you this question. So, when not to use NGRX? Because you said that when you face a problem of shared state, and we have to maintain this consistency across the huge application, and you have to use those actions, but I believe there are some cases when better not to use and go with the service-based approach. Yeah, definitely. My recommendation is always for a new application, unless you really know where that application is going to go in the future, start with services. Mm -hmm. It's the simplest way to get started quickly, and you're not going to go wrong with services. You might want to consider using NGRX if you have a lot of what I call sources of change. Okay, well, how do you define a source of change? So a source of change would be a producer of actions. So in a common application that makes HTTP requests, you have two sources of change. You have the user who's interacting with the application. Mm -hmm. They're one source of change. So and he can click and change something because or, there will be underlying logic for right. under user click, for example. Exactly. The second source of change is your backend. So you're mm -hmm. making an HTTP request and how it responds, mm -hmm. that's the second source of change. If you only have two sources of change, you probably aren't going to get a lot of out of NGRX. Okay. But if you have, say, three or four, maybe you have a WebSocket connection to your backend, or you're building a game and there's some kind of game loop with time-based changes. So that's a good rule of thumb, that you can think, okay, if I have only two sources of change, like HTTP request and user, I might not have need NGRX. But if right. there's a WebSocket, if there is some uh, other interaction, what kind of interaction can we have? Uh, time, browser APIs, like Web USB and Web Bluetooth. Um, local storage, index indexdb, any of those asynchronous browser APIs, exactly. those are all going to be unique sources of change. So if you have some timers, um, Bluetooth yep. API, WebSocket API, indexdb, HTTP, user, that's when it, this number grows of sources that may produce a change, that may be something to consider but start using NGRX. Exactly. But if you don't have, you better not overcomplicate your app, right? Right. NGRX introduces a lot of complexity to an Angular application because it's built on this concept of indirection. That is indirection. So going back to our product example, our product page, when the user hit that save form, the component did not decide how state changed. Instead, we decoupled how state changes from the places that mm -hmm. would cause new events to arise. And this indirection is really great. It's what gives us those benefits of testability and serializability but it also makes the application harder to reason about. Mm -hmm. It becomes a lot more difficult in an NGRX application to trace where state's changing or how side effects get triggered. And this is, can be really hard to comprehend an application built this way. But there's something that there's a lot of um, noise about it that I can do time travel debugging. Oh, yes. I mean, so I can trace the state changes, uh, like looking what actions have been uh, fired. Right. Um, the way that store mechanism works is it's built on something called log-based development, mm -hmm. which is you can replay how state changes in your application by reproducing the same set of actions that were dispatched. Mm -hmm. The cool benefit of this is we've built these things called the NGRX store dev tools, and it shows you this log of actions. You can click through each action in that log, and your application will magically time travel back to so what it looked like. So you can do like. undo. You can undo. You can redo. You can download As you are using some a notepad, you type something and then you control Z and it moves back to the previous state and then you redo the action. Right, it's like undo for your entire Angular app. That's pretty cool. So, can we sum up what we have learned? I mean, uh, in just a couple of sentences that we have NGRX, which is like a store. We have uh, actions and reducers. Right. And we need it when our application is growing into complexity in a form of shared state, we need to maintain the consistency. Right. But if we are like using application with just two source of truth, 
a source of change to yeah. sources of change like HTTP and user, yep. that might be not the case for NGRX. Exactly. I think you hit it right on the head. So, Mike, thank you very much. That was awesome talking to you. I believe uh, we have we did kind of good job here. Yeah, I think so too.